Jackie at one point. Good day to you. Yes. Good day. Good day. My goodness. Good day. Good day. Good day. I can spend. Enchanté. <laughs> Any time a woman offers her hand, uh, I should take advantage, should I not? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I shall. Good day to you. Uh, uh, good day, friends. I, I could uh, spend the entire afternoon clasping each and every one of your hands, and that would be a delightful afternoon indeed. But allow me simply to say to one and to all, good day, friends. Good day. Yes, sir. Now, uh, well, it's not a funeral, is it? No. <laughs> hey. Uh, at least not my own, I hope. Uh, do not put me in the ground so soon. We are Virginians, are we not? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, Did someone say no? <laughs> if you're not from Virginia, then where are you from, friends? North Carolina. North Carolina. Yeah. Maryland, good day to you, Papists from Maryland. Where? Georgia, Georgia indeed, you southern now uh, state. Uh, uh, North Carolina. There's a great deal of you from North Carolina. Is that what I heard? Yes, yes sir. Uh, do you know, uh, I, I have a great tie to North Carolina. Uh, I'm, I'm a Virginian myself, proudly so, a bit uh, biased in my own regard upon that matter. Uh, but nonetheless, do you know whose father fixed the boundary between North Carolina and Virginia? Yours? Yours. Yes, that was a hint there. <laughs> uh, Peter Jefferson, have you heard of him? Yes. 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 I thought you said you were Virginians. Yes. No. You know Peter Jefferson's name still resounds with more authority even in this year of 1779 than my own, even though that I am a governor, governor of this great state, and even know that uh, I now live in that three-story pile of ostentation you see there. Uh, Peter Jefferson's name resounds with more authority. Have you seen the Jefferson Fry map? Yes. 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 Have you been to Mr. Wythe's home? Yes. yes. Mr. Wythe, of course, is the, the man who taught me Law. Yes, indeed. For three years I studied under Mr. Wythe. Three very, sometimes very long years. There's only two ways a man may become an attorney. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm attempting to change that now in this year of 79, but uh, when I was becoming an attorney, you could either extricate yourself from this entire continent and go to an inn of court. I in inn of court over in London if you wish to understand the language and in Edinburgh if you wish to not understand the language. <laughs> And then you could become an attorney, or you could take the other path, the path that I took. That is to study under a well-respected, well-established attorney. Uh, a bit of an apprenticeship, although not codified as such, not as formal as, an, as a true apprenticeship. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, I studied under Mr. George Wythe. Uh, there, is a, there is no curriculum that one may choose to study to become an attorney. There's no set length of time that one may choose to become an attorney. Uh, you, you need only pass one exam. One exam. How simple is that? Sounds quite nice, doesn't it? No. One examination, even given entire, entirely orally. You need not write anything down. That sounds nice, doesn't it? No. The entire examination is given uh, entirely in Greek and Latin. <laughs> there it is. Does it sound so nice now? No. Okay. Uh, nonetheless, uh, I studied for three years under Mr. George with... Uh, you know how long Patrick Henry studied law before he became an attorney? Six weeks. Three weeks. <laughs> And yet he passed the, the exam, did he not? Yes. Yes, he did, unfortunately. Do you know who signed off on Mr. Henry? You must have two uh, attorneys present at your examination, your oral examination. Do you know who one of those attorneys was signing off on Mr. Patrick Henry? Patrick Henry? Not me, no. no. <laughs> not my father. No. No. With. George With. Can, can I confide something in, in you, friends? Yes, sir. And, and you may keep it a, a secret. Certainly. <laughs> Well, you appear trusting faces. Very good. <laughs> Mr. Wythe confided in me. Uh, he said, when I signed off on Patrick Henry, I told him, it is my hope, Mr. Henry, that you shall stand amongst such learned attorneys that someday you might eventually become one. Oh. We're still waiting for that day, are we not? Correct. And nonetheless, uh, 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 Mr. Henry was our first elected governor of this great commonwealth of Virginia, was he not? Yes. Yes, he was. And now he has been rusticated. You're welcome. <laughs> you know what rusticated means, yes? yes. Put out to pasture. <laughs> we have a, a, a term limits put in place. Uh, there are three allowable one-year terms uh, that a, a governor in Virginia under this new commonwealth may serve. It is my belief that there should be term limits instituted across every single level of government, period. Yes? Yeah. Clearly you're not politicians. <laughs> I say it this way, term limits are a great bulwark against corruption in government. 
Term limits are put into place so as to disallow a man from swelling larger than the size of the seat that he holds. And so we hope to found this country not upon blood right, not upon this idea that you being born into a certain lineage, a certain heritage, you have the right to lord over another association of men because of your birth. We're not founding this country upon divine right that some god or gods has given you or your association of men the right to lord over all the rest. We are founding this country upon principles, principles of equality, of justice, this idea that what you grant to one, you must grant to all, and can friends, principles ever die? No. Yes, they can. That was a trick question. Catch up. <laughs> <laughs> principles can die. How? I've forgotten. You brought your minds with you, did you not? If they're not upheld. If they're not upheld. This coming from a woman. Wow. <laughs> Principles can die, friends, if you allow them. You allow this idea of justice, this idea of equality, these ideas that what you grant to one, you must grant to all, this idea that in this country, all men are born equal. We allow, yes, free and equal. I, I do apply them both. If we allow these ideas, these principles to die, then what are we fighting this war for? Why are we currently shedding our co-mingled blood, soaking this soil, if not to uphold this new idea, this new experiment? And it is an experiment, is it not? Yes, sir. We are attempting something, friends, that has never truly been done before. We are attempting to turn the entire, the entire power of government over to, yes, the mob. <laughs> but have you not heard it said? I know I have heard it said. I have argued with some of you, perhaps, sometimes quite fiercely. Some of you say that I would rather have one king than a thousand petty tyrants. And perhaps there is some truth in that. Tyranny has many heads, many forms, does it not? Not just in one man wearing one crown. Tyranny may come in the form of apathy. Yes? yes. Mm -hmm. I say it this way. Please do not dash our ship of state upon the rocks of apathy or ignorance. Apathy or ignorance. These are two perhaps inherent pitfalls of a self-government. A government that is indeed run by the people may indeed, well, can you imagine, can you imagine, I know this may be hard for you to imagine, but can you imagine a time when the, that right of suffrage has expanded, perhaps in 170 years, to include, yes, even the women? And can you imagine a time when 50% of the people who have the right to vote choose not to exercise it? What is that but a tyranny of apathy? Who is running this country? Politicians. Well, if you step back, if you 50%, Let's, let's have an experiment. Look to the person on your left. Look to them. That's fine. You can look at the back of their head. <laughs> Statistically, in your time, one of you didn't vote. What is this but tyranny of apathy? So what is the guard against apathy, friends? To vote, yes. What else? To be informed. Well, I am ever an advocate of the free press. The press is also a great bulwark against corruption in government. I have said as much, or will say as much, in a few years. I've said it now, but I will also say it later. <laughs> it, will, it will be pervasive in my entire life, this idea of a free press. And I say it this way. A newspaper should have nothing but facts printed in it. And yet, I also finish that quote by saying any newspaper with nothing but facts in it will certainly have no subscribers. <laughs> you are the bulwark of this entire government. Let us not forget, friends, that when you, when you look into a looking glass, you should see a king. When you look into a looking glass, you should see a king. We are taking the crown off of one man's head and we are placing that crown upon all men. All men. It is my hope, friends, that three years ago, in 76, I had the opportunity to write the most treasonous document I have ever had the opportunity to write. 
We know the punishment for treason, do we not? Hanging. Hanging until not quite dead. And then you are cut down. And then your bowels are removed. And they are burnt in front of you while still alive. And then you are drawn and quartered. And somewhere in there you die. Hopefully. We 56 men who signed that Declaration of Independence knew this. And yet I ask you, friends, if your government will not fight for your rights, then who must? You. You must. This whole attempt at this enterprise of self-government, this whole attempt at this experiment, is to do something new. We have been down the road of monarchy uh, long enough, have we not? We have had enough monarchy, yes? yes. The world has had enough monarchy, yes? yes? There's a monarch who sits on a throne in England, a monarch who sits on a throne in Spain, a monarch who sits on a throne in France, a divinely vested emperor sits on a throne in Peking, a shogun sits on a throne in Japan, a tsarina sits on a throne in St. Petersburg, a sultan in Constantinople, but here in America, we have asked ourselves this audacious, this radical question. Are we ready to self-govern? Yes. Yes. Is mankind ready to self-govern? Have we finally progressed to a state wherein we can cogitate upon this idea that we do not need a crown? We do not need blood right or divine right. That every man is himself a king. And in that moment, when you go home into your various parts of this beautiful fledgling country, and you look into your own looking glass, I want you to see the solution to every problem that you have before you in this entire government, in this entire nation. For in that face that stares back at you is the solution. If you choose to act. If you choose to guard against apathy. So now ignorance. Do not dash the ship of state upon the rocks of apathy or ignorance. What is the guard against ignorance, friends? Education. Education. That's simple. That's not as slippery as apathy. I would say that the answer to the, to the most recent is also the answer to the former. The guard against ignorance is indeed education, but I would also say that the guard against apathy is an education. If we, the people, understand our necessity, that great weight, that great mantle that stands on our shoulders, if we understand it, then we will have no choice but to act. My father, Peter Jefferson, used to tell me, if you wish to know what type of man you are, Thomas, do not ask yourself. Act. Action will delineate and define you. Peter Jefferson, the man. Peter Jefferson, whose name resounds with more authority than my own. Peter Jefferson, who fixed the boundary between North Carolina and Virginia. Peter Jefferson, who, if you believe family lore, could upend two hogsheads of tobacco, each weighing a thousand pounds at once. <laughs> we still tell that family lore today. This is the moment we stand on, friends. This is the critical minute in which to act. And we should act now while ourselves, we, are united, while our rulers remain just. While we have this idea of term limits, while we have a free press, this is, a, this is an experiment indeed. I say that if this experiment lasts a generation, it will still be an experiment. We can extrapolate further to say if it lasts 241 years, it will still be an experiment, ever moving, ever changing, ever altering. We are hoping to create a government, friends, that can change through time. What is the benefit of this? It's always improving, yes. Because mankind, who said that? You, sir, with your Yorktown hat. <laughs> I know, it's a small town 12 miles removed from here. Does it have some significance in our future? I hope so. I hope so too, sir. <laughs> uh, this, is, uh, this, is, uh, um, this is pervasive also throughout history, that mankind changes. Mankind alters through time and perhaps, hopefully, progresses through time. Think back to 150 years ago, friends. Think back. Are we better today than we were then? I'm glad to hear that six of you agree. <laughs> <laughs> Mankind progresses through time. So if we wish to create a government that changes over time and might perhaps even last 241 years, then one of the greatest necessities <laughs> that that foundation of the government must be built upon is this idea of change. We must change through time. My dear friend James Madison, he's fairly newly minted in this year of 1779, but I like him a great deal. I, th I believe there will be greatness ahead of that small man. James Madison says it this way. 
A people get the government they deserve. Let us make certain we get the government they deserve. Yes? I say it this way. Man cannot wear the same clothes at 40 that he wore at 14, can he? So should our laws change over time to reflect the progress of mankind. Yeah. Or else, what is, the, what is the other necessity? If we create a government that is too, too rigid, too inflexible, then what must happen to that very government if a people progress farther than the government itself? Breaks. It will fail, yes. And how? By the people? How? Through rev revolution? Probably from within. From within? And certainly through bloodshed. Wouldn't it be nice, sir, to create a government that can change over time, where we're going to have peaceful revolution every two years, every four years, every six years, eight years? Wouldn't that be nice? This is an experiment, friends. Mankind is imperfect, yes? Yeah. Indeed. So, mankind cannot create a government that is better than mankind itself. This is impossible. I say this. It is impossible. And yet, if we progress over time and allow for change within government, then our government can reflect that change and progress. This is a hope. It is a, it is a strange enterprise indeed. We are reaching back to two ancient forms of government to hope, hopefully create this new government. Of course, those two forms of government are... <clears throat> Greece, yes, Greece, the Hellenistic gift of... Democracy. democracy. That every man gets a voice. We like this, yes? yes. yes. And yet, you have read history, have you not? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh no. Give me more hope than this, friends. Sorry. You have read history, haven't you? Yes. Yes. What is the most important subject I say there is to study on the entire globe? History. Why? <laughs> so we don't repeat it. That would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> and yet what do we see throughout history but repeated mistakes? This means either one of two things. Either mankind is choosing not to read history, or we are reading history, and choosing to remain ignorant of, of, the, of the mistakes therein. History provides a manual, a platform by which we may progress through time and avoid those mistakes made generations prior. This is a lovely idea, isn't it? That we can avoid all of these ancient mistakes so that we can step into terra incognita, unknown earth, and this new enterprise, this new experiment in self-government, avoid the old mistakes so that we can make new mistakes. <laughs> Mankind is imperfect. We will make new mistakes, but let's make new mistakes so that someday our children and our grandchildren can read of our new mistakes and see them as old mistakes to guard against. This is how mankind progresses. This is why I say history is the most important subject a man may study. And this coming from me, who enjoys a, a non-discriminatory array of subjects, from language to music to architecture to government theory to philosophy to natural philosophy, that's the sciences, botany, zoology, chemistry, astronomy, history, I put it at the very top. So what are we doing now in this, in this government? Well, we're attempting to marry this Hellenistic gift of democracy, which, if you've read history, those six of you, I thank you. <laughs> if you've read history, you know that pure democracies always fail. Yes? Who, what did you say in the back? Mob rule. It's a lovely turn of phrase. You have a very dark outlook on humanity, do you not? <laughs> and you are correct. In a pure democracy, the 51% wears one collective sovereign crown, do they not? And if you're a democracy, they do. And yet the 51%, we like the, uh, this idea that every man gets a vote, every man gets a voice. The 51% should steer the ship of state, thus helping to ensure this idea that the greatest amount of happiness goes to the greatest number of its people. This is mutually beneficial. And yet what happens, you might find this well and good if you find yourself in the 51%, you wear one sovereign crown. You are sovereign indeed, collectively, but what happens if you are the 49%? You're know, kind of pointless. You're in the minority, are you not? Mm -hmm. In a pure democracy, is the minority sovereign? No. In a pure democracy, the majority may do what they wish with the minority, even take away their rights. Do we like this? No. So how do we guard against this? How do, we, how do we include the inherent benefits of a pure democracy and yet guard against the inherent negative effects of a pure democracy. Well, perhaps with another ancient gift of government, because we have read history. Mm -hmm. yes. Rome. Yes. Rome! Rome! Who said that? Me. You are quite young indeed. How old are you, sir? Ten. Say again. Ten. Ten. 
out of the mouth of a babe. <laughs> Congratulations, young sir. What is your name? Daniel. Daniel. We, are, we are attempting to mesh, to, to squeeze together two ancient forms of government which did not exist together in their times. In, 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 a, in a Roman Republic, uh, who wears a crown? The collective 51% or the individual, Daniel? Yes, sir, again, out of the mouth of a babe. The individual. And as such, if you find yourself in the minority, the 49%, the majority cannot take away your rights, your fellow man cannot infringe upon your rights, and your government cannot infringe upon your rights because you individually are sovereign. Do we like this? Yes. yes. This is an experiment, friends. We will make mistakes. This is going to be imperfect. This is going to be tumultuous. After all, let's not forget we are handing the government over to the mob. <laughs> I say it this way, malo periculosum libertatum, quam quietum servitutum. You speak Latin? Nope. <laughs> I thought you said you were enlightened. No. Malo periculosum libertatum, quam quietum servitutum. I would take a tumultuous liberty over a peaceful slavery. Peace exists in dungeons. It does not make them nice places to live. Our mother country, before we detached, in 1775, when I wrote the de uh, my other declaration, which no one ever talks about, but I wrote a declaration in 75 as well, called the Declaration of Causes and Necessity of Taking Up Arms, and I say our mother country has left us no middle ground between perfect, harmonious freedom and abject slavery. Well, given those two choices, which would you choose? Perfect, harmonious freedom. And yet it will be tumultuous indeed, simply because we are attempting to turn the power over to you. So let us take these ideas, this foundation that we have laid before us today, and let us look at how we in 1779 are attempting to change our government to allow for flexibility over time and indeed reflect that current manifestation of what is important to a people through the system of laws. A system of laws, friends, is nothing more than what is important currently to a people. So how are we in 79 creating change? Last year, in seven, uh, no, two years ago in 1777, I was on a committee of, of five men. I'm always on committees of five. I don't know. Uh, five men, Thomas Ludwell Lee, Edmund Pendleton, George Mason, uh, uh, George Wythe, my mentor and teacher, and myself. We were appointed to revise the entire legal code of Virginia, to look at every single word of every single one of our laws and ask ourselves which laws should be excised entirely under this new system, which laws should be altered, and which laws, friends, should be created entirely new. Well, um, that committee of five, one man considered himself too sick to carry on. That's uh, George Mason, and so he bowed out. We were a committee of four then. One man uh, got called home on domestic business, uh, Edmund Pendleton, and so we were a proud committee of three. One man died, Thomas Ludwell Lee, and so we are a proud committee of two to revise the entire system of laws in Virginia. Who were the two remaining? You and Will. Myself, Thomas Jefferson, and George with my mentor. His home just sits on Palace Green. That's why I motion in that direction. We, Mr. With and I, put forth 126 new bills by which we may consider ourselves proud and free Virginians in this great new commonwealth. Four of those bills I wish to present to you. Uh, they are number 20, number 51, number 79, and number 82. Number 20, we are doing away with primogenitor and entail. Yes. Okay. Stop. I thought there would be more applause. No, 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 you, you missed your mark. You must catch it on the next one. Primogenitor and entail. More Latin for you, friends. Uh, prima means First. genitor. Born. 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 Offspring. I was the happy recipient of primogeniture and entail. I'm the eldest Jefferson son, so I received... Everything. I have older sisters. Nothing. I have older sisters. What do they receive? Nothing. Nothing. Nothing that I wouldn't give them. And I do have a social obligation to do just that, which I do. And yet it is my belief, sir, that in this new enlightened age, you, as the executor of your estate, should be able to pass your estate along to all of your children, should you not. This has ancient ties to monarchy, this idea of primogenitor and entail. This has ancient ideas to feudalism, whereby families retain power from generation after generation by being forced through government mandate to pass that entire estate along to your eldest son. Are we not doing away with all things monarchical? 
I understand that's a tricky way to answer. You say yes, I mean, are we not doing the way? Yes, we are not. No. So no, I suppose is the <laughs> <laughs> I shall improve upon it, friends. I'm an attorney. I get paid by the word, you know. <laughs> the world needs more attorneys, yes? No. <laughs> I believe the world needs more attorneys. I say as much. I also say it's my, uh, my happy circumstance to be born into a generation in which attorneys are finally highly thought of. How things change. <laughs> Prior to me, attorneys were not highly thought of. We were thought of as sharpers, pettifoggers, ones who would steal your money by representing you because we can simply speak Latin. Uh, so, private generation entail. Bill number 20, doing away with it. Bill number 51, we are doing away with slavery in Virginia. Good. I'm happy to hear this response. We cannot... We cannot hold in one hand in this new country that man is born free and equal and yet continue to hold in the other hand the lash of slavery. Can we? No. We begin on a lie. We begin on a lie. Slavery was forced upon us and yet we may rectify it. Yes? yes. yes. We do not carry the sins of our fathers. We have the choice here before us to end slavery. For once and for all, and I understand, I own slaves. I understand those of you who own slaves will indeed question, how am I to make prosperity? How am I to make money? How dare you, the government, <clears throat> knock on my door and remove from me my rightful property? That was said of me in 76, you know. The Continental Congress, when I attempted to end slavery, not just for Virginia, but the entire United States of America, with a clause I had included in the Declaration of Independence, saying that we will not practice slavery in this new United States of America. And yet two states, two of them, said we will not sign this, Jefferson, with this clause therein. You red-breached revolutionary trying to remove from me my rightful property. And so it was struck, so we could be we the 13 rather than we the 11. So we could be unanimous. It was struck and pushed to another day. Well, that day, friends, in Virginia is today. And we will deal with it. Now, this bill must be presented to a body of men in a house, all of whom own slaves. How do you get a man to vote against his own self-interest? That's Money. truly the question. How do you get a man to vote against his own self-interest? How do you get a man to see this as beneficial that the government's going to knock on your door? and remove your property from you. I know not, but I know it is right. I know we cannot continue with this abhorrent practice, I call it. And so we shall attempt to end it. I believe, again, through education. If a people begin to demand the rights which they now see as inherent among themselves, regardless of the soil that's beneath their feet, regardless of the flag that flies above their head, then the people will begin to vote into office men who think like that. And then our government will have no choice. And so that brings me to my next bill, bill number 79, my bill for the more general diffusion of knowledge. What does this sound like? Public education. Education at the state's expense. Publicly funded education for men and, yes, gasp, women. women. You should be educated, yes? yes? This is a right, is it not? Yes. Have you read John Locke? Yes. Oh, good, yes. <laughs> In his second treatise on government, John Locke says that mankind comes into this world with two inherent rights, sanctity of life and the ability to use one's own mind, one's own reason. No government can tell you what to think, no government can tell you what to publish, and no government can tell you to whom to pray. Yes? yes. And yet what do we see when we pick up any tome of history but governments infringing upon those very rights? We're doing something new. We're stepping into terra incognita. We will make mistakes. But it is my belief that education is a right, and you should be educated. I was educated because my father could afford it. Common man here in Williamsburg cannot be educated. The middling class might make 40 pounds a year. You know how much my education cost when I was knee-high? 20 pounds a year. Is this a viable prospect for a majority of mankind here? No. Nope. Nay. And what do we see if we allow only the wealthy to achieve an education? What do we see? Aristocracy. Who said that? Yes, sir. Aristocracy. That is exactly what I say. Have you read my quotes? 
We begin to create an aristocracy anew in this continent if we allow education only to be accessible by those who can't afford it. This is a right. It is a right. And lastly, my bill numbered 82, my statute for Virginia for religious freedom. You have the ability to practice your religion as you see fit without fear or force of government. There is no place, none, for government between you and your creator. Yes? Yes. yes. And yes, this even applies to the Baptists. <laughs> yes! I thought you said you were Virginians. Nope. You, you would be well accustomed to this idea that, uh, well, we call our jails Baptist prayer houses. Thanks. Our Baptists are jailed. You know this, yes? Yes. Why are there laws on Virginia's books in this moment in 1779 that say a papist, for example, <clears throat> you from Maryland, a papist, one who follows the Pope, can only own a horse uh, less than five pounds sterling. Why does that matter? Why? This is the age of enlightenment. I care not what my neighbor's religion is, whether he believes in one God or twenty, it neither steals money from my pocket nor breaks my leg. It is simply an opinion. And yet, sure as the sun will rise tomorrow, there will be one man on this globe killing another because of a difference of opinion. Let us do something new. Let us make a new mistake. Right? Indeed. Let us make a new mistake. For what might happen? We might learn. My goodness! Our children might read of our mistake and, and further rectify it. Is that not progress? Yes. This bill, this bill 82 applies to Baptists, applies to Papists, applies to Episcopalians, Church of England, applies to uh, uh, the Hebrew. We have one Hebrew here in Williamsburg. We're very cosmopolitan. <laughs> it applies to Mohammedans, Deists, Dunkards, Quakers. What you grant to one, you grant to all. You must grant to all. What is the benefit of this idea, this principle we are founding this country upon? What you grant to one, you must grant to all. Equality. Equality, yes. No tyranny. There's a self-preservation involved. Does it not then work to your benefit to protect your neighbor's rights? Yes, sir. Because what happens if you do not? Yours might be taken. Yours could be taken too. You set a precedent. You set a precedent. If we allow the government to take away your neighbor's rights, then that allows the government, that very same government, to use that as a precedent to take away your rights. There's a self-interest in this idea, self-preservation, that, well, now I might not believe in that God or those 20 gods, but I will protect his right to believe so, because in doing so, I can practice as a Baptist. My goodness, as a Baptist here in Virginia. Anyway, friends, it has been said of me that I cannot string three sentences together, but I've done quite well for myself, have I not? <laughs> Nonetheless, uh, I, I wish, uh, as your governor, I, I understand there are, there are many questions. I understand there's many hesitations, many reservations, uh, and a great deal of uncertainty in this age. And I wish to put those to rest. I wish to have a mutual conversation with you. Would that be amenable to you? Yes, sir. That you may bring your minds to this table, that you may, as you now steer this ship of state, also steer this conversation. Yes? yes. This is your nation. Mm. You are a king. So let us engage in mutual civil discourse. That's the word. That's the key, is it not? Civil. We can talk about anything, friends. By the simple raising of your hands, we can speak of government theory or philosophy or natural philosophy, the sciences, botany, zoology, chemistry, astronomy. We can speak of my past. Uh, if you wish, uh, if you have a question of my past, I'm happy to speak of it. We can speak of, of the current, the hope for this country, the reality for this country. There existing a great gulf. We could even hypothetically go into the future when I might hypothetically become third president of the United States of America. <laughs> <laughs> I can tumble through time if you wish, friends. I can meet you where you are. For me, the year is 1779. We have a great deal of work ahead of us. We have not won the war. We are entirely uncertain as to the direction of this country. There's a great deal of debate, but we do know that we have a continual eye towards turning the power over to the people. And there is some pushback in this, but, well, as I stand as your governor now, I, I do not enjoy that office. I live, as I say, in that three-story pile of ostentation, a representative of uh, the old government, the old guard. But the government is now yours, friends, so in proper parliamentary procedure, I shall cede the floor over to you, friends. Uh, do we have a second for this motion? Second. Aye. Motion has been seconded. Uh, ayes? Aye. Nays? <laughs> Nays. <laughs> Nays. 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 
Your voice counts, ma'am. <laughs> well, in 170 years, it will. Yeah. Oh. Is that not progress? Yes. Yes. Is that in itself not an example of how we might see uh, differently these words? The words that all men are born free and equal have not changed. Our perception of them has. That's progress, yes? Yes, sir. So, ma'am, I look forward to your vote in 170 years. The ayes have it. Yours is the floor. Yes, in the back. Yes. Mm -hmm. I thank you for your question, sir. Uh, it's perhaps a bit prima. So, C of E, this is man is talking of a Church of England, yes? How do we distinguish between the Church of England and Episcopalian? Well, the Church of England, even in this year of 1779, how many uh, state-sanctioned churches do we have in Virginia? One. One. Is this equitable? No. <clears throat> we are attempting to disentangle the church and the state. I say it's a great conspiracy. In fact, I say it's a conspiracy that began in 1458 with a mistranslation. A mistranslation by Chief Justice Priso. Chief Justice Priso wrote uh, in 1458 that our current law should give credence to ancient scripture. What do you think of when you, when you hear the words ancient scripture? Bible. The Bible, yes, well, the Bibles, right? And which one? There begins another conversation. Septuagint. That's, that's, uh, 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 so this is the problem with translation, sir. Uh, when Chief Justice Priso wrote that, that our current law should give credence to ancient scripture. There is a, a gentleman who translated Chief Justice Priso named Finch, spelled like the bird, F-I-N-C-H. And Mr. Finch uh, translated uh, ancient scripture to holy scripture, which I might have made the same mistake had I not read just three paragraphs later when Chief Justice Priso makes a dis uh, delineation between ancient scripture and holy scripture. Now, certainly if he meant holy scripture three paragraphs prior, he would have said holy scripture. He did not. He said ancient scripture. And then uh, uh, Mr. Hale cites uh, Mr. Finch's incorrect translation. And then Mr. Wingate cites the, the incorrect translation without, uh, or rather quotes the incorrect translation without citing anyone. And then in 1728, a case, a court case appears. Uh, king v. Wollstone, sir. King meaning the king. Wollstone uh, was a gentleman who wrote uh, something ill against, uh, abusive against Christianity in a newspaper. That's right. And so in that moment, sir, that sentiment had been echoed link after link, quote after quote, so many times that in 1728 in that court case, our civil courts said absolutely we have the authority to try an ecclesiastical matter. This is dangerous. So the Church of England is what we are attempting to separate from, the C of E, as you say. The C of E, we are attempting to, to disentangle this church and the state. I say there are three eventualities when you have a marriage of church and state, and I say this because I have read history. history. Those three eventualities are cruelty, meanness, and bloodshed. And yet we still have one state-established Church of England. Episcopalians might stand a bit apart from the Church of England being disestablished and standing on their own, not being a, a, a particular... I thank you for your question, sir. The gentleman asks, uh, 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 well, first rather accuses me of putting a lot of energy into this experiment. And then, uh, and then says, am I worried that the, uh, with the war going on, I'm worried about job security. <laughs> I'm a politician, sir. I'm always worried about job security. <laughs> uh, I, I uh, this year, the war is not going well. No. We are, we are up against the mightiest force the world knows at this moment. We are outgunned, we are outmanned, we are outtrained, we are outpaid, we are outstockinged. Our men don't have canvas for tents. I have sent our Virginia line away. I sent them away to, to Washington, who wrote me and said, uh, Virginia is not invaded. Your Virginia line of men are quite literally sitting around. Would they not be better put to use serving with the Continental Line? And I said, yes, absolutely. And of course, this leaves Virginia... Defended. Undefended. Does that worry me? Yes. Might we in one year's time be invaded? Yes. Does this, uh, um, this is not a fait accompli. We, we know not what tomorrow may bring, no, uh, no more than any other man. And yet, I know of no higher cause to shed blood than for the natural rights of man. 
job security is a funny term when I, when I am a statesman, when I am a proponent of this idea of term limits. For inherently, I understand that I have no job security. I, I serve at the will of the people, and I serve until the term has been completed, and so then I must be rusticated, returned to pasture, to remember the principles which first bought, brought me to public office in the first place. Um, I hope we win this war. It has already lasted uh, uh, one year longer than I thought it would. I say in 76, I do not believe this war will last more than two years. <clears throat> I, I, I apply this for two reasons, debt and stomach. First and foremost, do you, you remember the Seven Years' War, friends? Yeah. It was not so long ago. The Seven Years' War, the French and Indian War, the Seven Years' War, which last, lasted nine years, the, also called the French and Indian War, which was not between the French nor the Indians. I don't know where they get these names, but they're wrong. <laughs> the Seven Years' War was fought on this soil, yes? Yes, yes sir. Because a certain governor who lived in that house uh, had vested interest in the Ohio Company, the land speculation company out west. 800,000 acres uh, was uh, the uh, Ohio Company was, was in charge of. And then the French uh, encroach upon this Ohio land. And so what does our governor do in that moment? Send in troops. He sends in troops, does he not? To protect his own personal interest and perhaps the interest of the state, but, but let's not forget he had a great deal of coin in the Ohio Company. And who did he put in, the, in charge of those troops? The, the current commander of our our continental line, Washington. This, this touched off an entire war, seven years war, as I have said. Now, the seven years war, the current British Empire is paying 50% of their entire income to pay for the interest on this one war. Did I say that again? The current British Empire is paying 50% of their entire income to pay for the interest of this one war. So I ask you, debt, this is the first, can they afford another long war here? No. no. Second, stomach. We know what happens to a people when they begin to tire of lengthy wars, yes? I do not believe the people, uh, our brothers across that great body of water, would enjoy another lengthy war in this, in this uh, part of the world. And so, for those two reasons, I say I do not believe it will last two years, but here, here we are in year three. Perhaps not much longer. It does worry me, sir. Do I have nightmares of being hung? None that I've written about. <laughs> but any sensible man would. You're an extremely wealthy man, as are a lot of people in your family. You could lose it all, including your wife, but mm -hmm. still, you put all this energy into it. The man uh, says that I'm a wealthy man and I could lose it all, including my life. You're correct. We are neighbors of Albemarle County? You're an Albemarle-ian. <laughs> oh, you're, you're from the Fluvanna. I used, to, I used to canoe up the Fluvanna River. Do you know this? When I was... Did you truly? You never saw me. <laughs> you know, when I was 20 years old, I was, I was canoeing on the, on the Fluvanna and the Rivanna, and I had this moment of, of inspiration. It was truly divinely inspired, um, that river that you're familiar with. I, I, and I thought in, in that one moment, it was autumn. And the, the light was slanting in at an angle through the trees, which has just, just turned this golden color. It's much like now, in fact. The foul smell wasn't coming off the river. It sometimes comes off the river. Serene, beautiful. And I, I, I thought in, in that one moment, truly, truly providence in this moment, I thought, my goodness, if this portion of the river were a bit deeper and a bit wider, then would the neighboring plantations not see further prosperity? Which is true. They would have a navigable river just out of their back door. They wouldn't need to trek their goods all the way to the east, all the way to a port here. They could put them on a canoe on a flat bottom and, and uh, uh, continue that journey with even greater expediency. And so I, I as the captain of my ship, I, I banked my, my canoe, I deboarded, and I knocked on every one of the neighboring plantation's doors. And over the course of two days, I raised 200 pounds sterling. And in that moment, for the, for the dredging of that river. I told them, would you not see further prosperity of your own plantations? We can go in together on this. And in that moment, I realized that uh, mankind, more than any other creature upon this entire globe, has the ability to take thought and convert it into action. 
to take thought and convert it directly into action. Mankind is quite industrious, perhaps the most industrious creature on this entire globe. Beavers perhaps have some say in that matter, but <laughs> certainly the most uh, industrious bipedal, yes? Uh, and in that moment I realized uh, that then where is man better suited to create change uh, about his fellow man and about his world than in public office. That is what I am attempting to do. That is why I have great energy upon this enterprise. I have been gifted great gifts because of my wealth. I was gifted 7,000 acres and 65 slaves when my father died. I was gifted an education, two tutors growing up, the College of William and Mary, the ability to study with George Wythe for three years because of wealth, because of affluence. It was also expected of me, you know my father, Peter Jefferson. He expects greatness. And so I'm hoping to fulfill something, fulfill a promise. But I thank you. We could lose it all. I could lose everything. We could. But there is no greater cause, is there? Friends, I, uh, I hate to inform you, time wastes too fast. I see many of your hands, and, and I wish to continue this confab, but I must allow uh, those of you who wish to leave, to leave. Perhaps uh, I could continue the confab under this just-turned autumnal oak here. Uh, before we leave, friends, I wish to, to, um, to say thank you. Uh, I wish to say thank you for being advocates of education. Thank you, young Daniel. Thank you uh, for being advocates of history. The most important subject there is to study. We have the ability here in Williamsburg, Williamsburg has this uncanny ability, in fact, to, to be able to speak of all the things that you're not supposed to speak of during Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> is that not true? Truth. <laughs> what do we speak of here? We speak of politics. We speak of, of religion. We speak of slavery. We speak of states' rights versus federal rights, constitutionality of law, judicial review. And yet we can do so and even have a difference of opinion and still remain friends. And is that not exactly so desperately what this country needs right now? Yes, sir. So, I hope you're applauding yourselves. Because th you can do this. My charge to you, you young knights, you newly minted kings, your quest your homework. I know you came here on vacation, but this is your homework. I'm giving you homework. I'm sorry. Nope. Your homework is to go out into this fledgling country, taking its first steps, and continue this conversation. Continue talking about these issues. And perhaps through civil discourse, perhaps through, through the utilization of not hot passion, but rather cool reason, we might engage in mutual conversation. We might engage in some forward momentum, move out of the stagnation. We might gain compromise. And perhaps even, friends, we might teach our politicians a thing or two. Yes? yes. This is your charge. This is your country. You are kings. Be the change you wish to see. When you look into a looking glass, see a king. See the solution. This nation is yours. The people get the government they deserve. So let's make certain we get the government we deserve. Let's make certain we don't throw in vain all of the blood that has been shed to get us this far in this great, grand, mistake-making experiment. Yes? Very good, friends. Until we meet again.